you're welcome to start. Have a good session. Thanks. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Turn my video on. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, second invited talk of uh, Crypto 21. Uh, we're very pleased to have Jens Groth here uh, to give the talk. Jens is the uh, is director of research at Definity, and he received his PhD from Aarhus University and then did a uh, postdoc at UCLA where he was awarded the 2007 UCLA's uh, Chancellor Award for postdoctoral research. Uh, he was then a full professor at the University of College uh, in London. His uh, research interests are quite varied. They include uh, electronic voting and mixed nets, uh, digital signatures, public key encryption, uh, zero knowledge proofs, and uh, mo most recently blockchain security. Uh, he was awarded this year's AsiaCrypt 2021 Test of Time Award uh, for his work on asymptotically optimal NIZK proofs and group signatures uh, without random oracles. And he has also co-invented uh, pairing-based SNARKs, uh, logarithmic sized proof systems uh, that underpin the bulletproofs uh, system, and zero knowledge proofs with constant prover overhead. So uh, we're very excited to have uh, Jens and to, to hear his talk on a world of SNARKs. Uh, so please welcome uh, Jens and uh, take it away. Uh, thank you, Chris, um, and thank you to the uh, program committee for the invitation. Um, uh, I've been with Definity for two and a half years now. We just launched the internet computer and, and my the focus of my work is on the security of the internet computer. Uh, so it's great to have the chance to, to uh, think more about SNARKs ag again. Um, and, um, and which is an area I've been working in for, for two decades. Um, I want to talk today about SNARKs and sort of like the information theoretic underpinning of SNARKs. Um, this is something that I think people have become more keenly aware of and, and more clearly distinguish what is the information theoretic core and what is the crypto compilation uh, that goes together to create uh, SNARKs. And I think it's a very useful distinction. So I want to take a tour of different SNARKs I've worked on and some other SNARKs and look at what is the information theoretic underpinning of those SNARKs. Um, okay, so let me start just with what is a SNARK. Uh, so everybody is up to speed on that. It's a succinct non-interactive argument of knowledge. Uh, so we have a statement known to both the prover and the verifier. Um, the prover has a witness and wants to convince the ver verifier that the statement is true. So the prover sends a proof to the verifier, the verifier checks the proofs and, and hopefully everything works out. Now the key properties of a SNARK is that it should be non-interactive. So there's no interaction between the prover and the verifier. The verifier just receives a proof and decides whether to accept or reject that proof. Then we also want the proof to be succinct, right? So it has to be much smaller than the statement to be proved. Uh, and particular SNARKs are used in, in the blockchain space and there it's very important that we reduce memory consumption as much as possible because these proofs may be replicated in many places. And then uh, finally, it's often in, in, in context we use them very important that these are proofs of, of knowledge that not only is the statement true, but actually the proof knows a witness to the statement. Uh, SNARKs may, may have other properties. Um, a SNARK may be zero knowledge, so it doesn't reveal anything about the witness. Now, in its nature, because it's succinct, there's a limit to how much information it can leak. Um, but SNARKs may or may not be fully zero knowledge. Um, uh, I'm also not going to go so much into succinctness. So, so the question is, does the definition really require the succinctness to be all the way down to polyloric rhythmic size, or do you allow a little more than that? I'm going to be pretty relaxed about that. As long as it's clearly sublinear communication, I'm happy to call it succinct. Um, there are also some definitions that really emphasize that the verifier should be very efficient as well. And depends a little on the statement whether that's possible or not, right? So in order to verify proof for a statement general, the 
uh, verifier has to read the full statement. Uh, so, so only when the statement is small compared to the witness size does it make sense to call, talk about uh, sublinear something in terms of verifier computation. Okay, so there's a wealth of, of different proof systems, um, and um, as the snarks are just one type of proof system, and I'm always a little ambivalent about the term snark. I think it's uh, uh, extremely useful to have a precise term for the kind of things that we do need in the blockchain space, and I do think that uh, uh, the core of it, that it's succinct, uh, and therefore it very easy to copy and send to many people is very important. Uh, and certainly non-interactivity is important in that context as well. On the other hand, I see uh, Snark as a bit of a fancy and catchy name. Uh, there are many other Starks come to spring to mind as, as well, right? And, and they are all, to me, just examples of proof systems. Uh, I was working in this area before these terms were invented. and. In general, we can think of proof systems that can have all sorts of properties. They can have security properties, efficiency properties, be based on different types of cryptography, and there can also be operational questions, such as what is the setup and what is the interaction and is it public coin or not? So there's a, um, many dimensions on which you can do different tweaks on, on proof systems, and to me, um, when I think about this space, I often just think about proof systems and then they may have some properties and, and not have other properties. Okay, so I want to uh, go back to, to time. I was thinking about when was the first time I, I learned about zero knowledge. Um, uh, and I think it was actually when I was back when I was a, a child, um, so 10 years or so. Um, and uh, this is a fake slide. This is not how I learned about zero knowledge first. Uh, I did not as 10 year old uh, read uh, Fox uh, papers. Um, so, so, but it was about the same time actually as, uh, as it was invented by Goldwasser, Mikhali and, and Rakov. Um, the way I encountered it was, in, uh, I think in a story that I, uh, that I heard, which was about an emperor and a hero, right? And uh, as uh, many good stories, uh, the hero goes through an enormous amount of obstacles uh, and the emperor re really doesn't like the hero and, and sets all these obstacles. And at some point, the emperor uh, uh, sets, um, sets uh, two balls covered with lids in, in front of the hero and, and promises that you know, either he will become incredibly wealthy uh, or he will be executed. And he has to pick one of these uh, balls. And if there's a gold inside, then he gets the gold. Uh, but if it's empty, he will be executed. And the hero, uh, fortunately for this story, is uh, suspicious of the emperor and realizes that the emperor may have just put two empty balls in front of him, right? And there's no chance of winning. Um, and indeed, that is what the emperor has done. But uh, as in good stories, the hero is uh, very clever and he changes the algorithm. What he does is he picks one of the balls and say, says, I choose this one. And then he lifts the lid on the other ball, right? And now everybody can see the other one is empty, and therefore the one he has chosen must be the one with the gold. And the emperor does not want to reveal that he's been cheating, and therefore the hero is rewarded. Now, the reason this story is sprung to my mind is because this is exactly what we're doing when we do non-interactive zero knowledge proofs, right? So, so. Um, so non-interactive zero knowledge proofs are like uh, invented by Bloom, Feldman, and Mikali in, in, in the 80s. Um, it can be set in, in what is called the hidden random bits model. And this is a information theoretic abstraction of sort of like the core ideas in a non-interactive zero knowledge proof. So in this model, there's a dealer that produces a uniformly random string. Um, 
And the prover can see the bits in this string, right? So think of the dealer as giving some cards, the prover can peek and see whether it's a zero or one that's written on the card. And the verifier does not know. But the prover can decide to disclose some of these cards to the verifier. Now, it's surprising that in this model, you can prove anything, right? It's just uniformly random string. What does it give you? What kind of power does it give to the prover? And, and the very cool idea is that you can do some statistical sampling, right? So if the prover, for instance, decides to sort this uh, all these cards in pairs um, and reveals the ones which have odd parity, then statistically speaking, the remaining cards should have even parity. And you can build more clever uh, structures by this statistical sampling and, and actually create them such that they can also be sort of put together and boost each, help each other to actually prove uh, a statement. Um, and the reason that I was thinking about that is because the simulation you do in, in those proofs is exactly the same as the hero did towards the emperor. Right. When you want to simulate something, then you choose the pairs in a, in a different way. You prepare the pairs such that you can actually reveal them. Uh, you have more a different statistical distribution and you can actually reveal them as either thing. OK, so so that's all like illustrates an information theoretic model that can underpin uh, a non interactive zero knowledge proof and then you can also do a cryptographic compilation of this uh, and get a, a real world proof out of it. In this case, the setup is a uniformly random string and the prover may choose um, <clears throat> uh, interpret those as, as blocks that are ciphertext. And then the prover picks keys for a bit encryption scheme um, and sends the public key to the verifier as part of the proof and also then opens some of these uh, ciphertext to, to, to the underlying plain text. And if it's a verifiable encryption uh, openings that we have in this encryption scheme, then that makes it possible to selectively disclose some of the, uh, the plain text bits to the verifier and hide some of the other the remaining uh, plain text bits. So that's sort of like the core idea in, uh, in uh, traditional uh, non-interactive zero knowledge proofs based on untrapped up permutations. Okay, so I want to to look then at, at more modern proofs, um, and I'm going to think a lot about interactive proofs that we make non-interactive using the future mirror heuristic. Um, and, and I'll, I want to walk through some of these proofs, uh, sort of thinking about what is the information theoretical model, what is the cryptographic way we realize them, and sort of see how those two play together. Okay, so let's uh, start with the uh, Shor's classical proof of, of knowledge of a discrete logarithm. So here the instance is a group element A. Uh, and the witness is the discrete logarithm of this group element. And the way the proof system works is that the prover picks up a random a blinding field element A naught uh, and computes uh, the exponentiation of that field element and sends that to the verifier. And now the verifier picks a random challenge, sends that to the prover. And the prover opens this linear combination here, uh, a naught plus, plus the challenge times the, the, the secret uh, discrete logarithm A. And it's pretty easy to see that if you plug in these numbers that indeed the verify will accept with this verification equation over here. Now, if we look at this information theoretically, what's really going on here? Well. It is that the prover is bound to some field element A, right? Picks a random blinding and, and sort of commits to that as well in a way that the verifier does not know what these elements are. 
And then the verifier sends a challenge X and gets some linear combination of those secret field elements. And as long as the verifier is guaranteed that is the answer really is this linear uh, combination of the field elements, then we get a, a proof of knowledge, right? And, and the core idea here is that um, if the prover would be able to answer two distinct challenges, right, then you would actually have two different evaluations of this linear combination. And that would be enough to determine the line uh, defined by the discrete logarithm and, and the blinding factor. And then you can determine the slope, which is indeed the, the discrete logarithm that the prover claimed to know. Now, I think this picture illustrates very well what is, uh, what is the core idea of, of Schnorr's uh, proof of knowledge, right? But it also is helpful because it, it points to ways you can extend this, right? So one natural question is, for instance, what instead of a line, we have a polynomial. Um, and indeed, you can do that, right? If the proof has multiple field elements and field elements, uh, then the challenge could define this polynomial. And if you get enough distinct challenges answered, then you can determine the full polynomial and therefore all the discrete logarithms. Right, and you can translate that back to, to, uh, uh, to a, a group with a discrete logarithm where you can compile this information theoretic model. So it generalizes Schnorr's proof of discrete logarithms where we can now prove that knowledge of the discrete logarithm of multiple elements in one go. And if we use the Fiat-Shamir heuristic, we may compute X as the hash. Uh, so, so it's sort of uh, looks random, right? Um, and that then gives us a non-interactive proof where you just send this initial element, hash things, and you send the answer. The verifier can himself recompute the challenge and decide whether to accept the proof. And that's the first example of, of a snark, right? It's a very simple snark, but it is a, uh, it's succinct because there are only um, one group element and two field elements that we send, right? And that's much less than the instance size. And it's non interactive, right? Because we're using the Fiat Shamir heuristic. So, so there we have our first snark. Um, there are different ways you can generalize that. Um, so, so one way to do that is um, uh, to prove knowledge of vectors instead of field elements. Um, and we're just using linear properties uh, here. So that works out perfectly well as well. So now you can commit to many uh, vectors of field elements. Uh, you pick a vector to blind everything, you get a challenge, and you compute vectors of polynomials, and exactly the same reasoning goes through. Right? Um, and what we have now, if we balance things correctly, let's say M and N are roughly the square root of, of N, which is the, the total number of, of field elements here. Um, then, then we actually get a, a root n sized uh, snark in the fear, with the Fiat Shamir heuristic, but where we are proving knowledge of n uh, field elements. And at this stage, the proof is smaller than both the instance size, right? Um, uh, and also at the same time, the instance is actually smaller than the witness size, right? It's actually committing to many field elements. Uh, with just one short instance. So, so that points to, to how we can get really powerful uh, sublinearity in, in proof systems. Okay, so information theoretically, what's going on here? Um, and, and the way we can abstract it is to say that we have this um, interactive uh, uh, um, deal commi commitment uh, model, right? So 
if we imagine this protocol and it could have more rounds of interaction, right? You can still, if you have multiple rounds of public coin uh, challenge, you can still use the Fiochemi heuristic to, to uh, compress it down to a non-interactive snark. So, so in this model, you could imagine that the prover commits to vectors of field elements, gets some message from the verifier, commits to another set of uh, field uh, vectors of field elements, gets another challenge, and so forth, right? And in the end, um, we have these uh, homomorphic properties. The verifier can query for linear combinations of those committed vectors. Um, and when we compiled this and, and did this in, in the uh, group with discrete logarithm, we could sort of like the prover could send these uh, answers to the verifier, the verifier could check it, right? But in this ideal model, we can simply uh, model that as something that where the prover is not involved at all. It's just the model that guarantees that indeed the verifier gets the correct linear combinations of the committed vectors. So that abstracts, this model here abstracts uh, uh, a lot of um, proof systems you could build over um, groups with discrete logarithms. Okay, um, proofs of knowledge are of course um, nice, but not super useful by themselves, but, um, but we actually can do more in this model here. Um, because of these uh, ability to do uh, uh, get linear combinations of committed vectors open, we get additive relations almost for free. Um, with some extra work, it's also possible to show that you can actually in this model prove that you have multiplicative relationships where you take, for instance, two vectors and show a third vector is the entry-wise product of each of those uh, uh, pairs of interest in the first vectors. You could also have some committed values and prove that you have a permutation of those committed values. And, and all the, those tools taken together can actually give us uh, succinct proofs for arithmetic circuit satisfiability. So if you have an arithmetic circuit of a field of size n, then you can get succinct proofs that have uh, size root n. Um, and it's sort of a similar ideas that um, underpin discrete log based proofs that have logarithmic size. Um, uh, so, so bullet proofs is, is one example of that and, and sort of based on, on an earlier paper from 2016. Um, um, but I guess this work also shows that uh, models are only good as as far as they actually describe reality there, you need a little extra ingredient, ingredient, namely that also the group elements you use in Peterson commitments to, to commit to things are, are key homomorphic. Um, so, so the idealized model would be a little different. And I guess it just goes to show that it's not always easy to be a theoretician, right? Um, there, it's very nice to come up with abstract ideal models of, of what's going on. Uh, I think it's great for building understanding, um, but, but it's also clear that, you know, when we have new cryptography, it might be new things that we can uh, use. And, and that would, again, would have to go back and, and change the model to incorporate those new features. Um, let me, jump to an, an earlier model because this is certainly not the first construction of uh, uh, succinct uh, proofs. Um, uh, and the, the first such construction was by, by Killian in 92. Um, and, and he used a different information theoretical model, uh, probabilistically checkable proofs. Um, and these are really cool proofs. It's uh, so sort of like you can prove a, a, a theorem um, in a way such that the verifier only needs to spot check that proof. So typically the proof will be bigger than the instance that you want to prove, but the advantage is that the verifier can be really efficient because the verifier only needs to 
check uh, a few parts of that proof, not everything. So think of the model as, as the prover can commit to say uh, n uh, field elements and that's uh, the proof. Uh, and then the verifier can come along and ask to see some of those field elements, but only a few of them. And the amazing thing in the PCP theorem uh, is that uh, you only need a small number of queries to, uh, to get overwhelming soundness. Okay, so, so what Killian did was to compile this into a, a, non, uh, um, um, zero, um, a succinct proof system. Um, and, and the tool to do that can be a collision resistant hash function. So basically what you do is you just take the PCP, uh, you commit to all these elements in the PCP using a Merkle tree, and you send the root of that Merkle tree to the uh, verifier. And now the verifier says, okay, I want to check uh, these parts of the uh, PCP. And then you, the prover reveals those parts and the paths to the Merkle root, right? And then the verifier can verify that indeed those are the correct elements that uh, he received. So once you have a PCP, you have this information theoretic core. It's actually a pretty simple construction you can use to build a succinct uh, interactive argument. Um, and then you can make it non-interactive using the field Shamir heuristic. Okay, another um, information theoretical model that has uh, come into vogue is uh, interactive oracle proofs. And those are generalizations of probabilistically checkable proofs. And the reason we need this generalization is because probabilistically checkable proofs are, um, are expensive to, to compute. So, so typically the PCP will be larger than um, the statement you want to prove is true. Um, and, and there may also be significant computation involved for the prover to create the PCP. Um, interactive Oracle proofs can be more efficient. Um, so what the generalization says is uh, it's essentially the same as a PCP, but now there are multiple rounds where the prover can commit to elements. So the prover commits to some elements, okay? There may be other interaction between the prover and the verifier, then the prover can commit to the next batch of elements and so forth. And during that uh, time, the verifier can uh, query for indices again and see, uh, get those revealed. Okay, and uh, interactive Oracle proofs, if they're public coin, then you can use Oracle trees and in the field Shamir heuristic to make it to, into a snark. So, so this interactive model allows us some better uh, efficiency, but we still get non-interactive uh, and very succinct proofs uh, with the field Shamir heuristic. Okay, so what is a um, broader landscape here, right? So I think what we're seeing is that there are now many different information theoretic models in, in play and I've just touched some of those, the hidden written random bits model, the ideal vector uh, linear commitments uh, and PCPs and interactive Oracle proofs. Um, there are also models you can use for designated verified proofs, uh, linear interactive proofs and, and for uh, pairing based snarks, um, getting non interactive linear proofs. Um, uh, I will not have time to get into, unfortunately, to, to pairing based snarks in, in this uh, presentation, but the ideas are again some, some of the same that you can have uh, some, some group elements, you can take linear combination of those, that's just generic group operations. And then in the end, the verifier may multiply those and, and check basically that quadratic equation holds over those uh, committed uh, field elements. There are also many ways you can compile things, right? You can use trapdoor permutations as in the original 
uh, non-interactive zero knowledge uh, proofs. You can use discrete log groups, pairings, and collision resistant hash functions, uh, and so forth. And it's not all of those combinations that, that fit together, right? But you can see it's so like uh, an enormous uh, space of, of different possible uh, combinations. Uh, and I think for that reason also, it's nice that people are uh, increasingly trying to separate out the information theoretic core from the cryptographic uh, compilation so you can analyze those uh, independently. Okay, so um, one question you may ask then is how do these different information theoretic models relate to each other? Um, and, and in some cases, uh, you have information theoretic models where you can do more than in other information theoretic models, They're in some sense stronger. Um, and that makes it possible to make more compact and more efficient information theoretic proofs. So the information theoretic core becomes uh, better, more efficient. But then the price you pay is typically in the cryptography because then you more, need more sophisticated cryptography to uh, instantiate this stronger information theoretic model. Um, so I wanted to compare uh, interactive linear commitments with the uh, IOPs, right? Um, so remember in interactive uh, linear interactive uh, commitments, you could commit to batches of vectors. Uh, and in the end, the verify was allowed to ask for uh, linear combinations of those committed vectors. In IOPs, you can just commit to field elements and then the verifier can query some of those uh, field elements. Um, but you can see that the uh, models can relate to each other, right? You could actually instantiate the interactive oracle proofs in the uh, interactive linear commitment model by encoding each field element in a vector and then query specifically for that vector, right? So if you issue a query which is zero for all the vectors and just one for one of the vectors, it will give you that vector. Um, and then that way you would get basically what is that particular field element. Uh, you can make some more efficient conversions, but what it shows is that it is possible to uh, um, to make a conversion of, of an uh, interactive oracle proof to something that's an interactive uh, proof in the interactive linear commitment model. Um, it turns out that it also works the other way around. You can actually compile uh, uh, the interactive linear commitment model into interactive oracle proofs. Um, and in order to do that, you use a, a linear error correcting codes. Um, so, so just a reminder that a linear error correcting code takes uh, K field elements uh, and, and maps it into um, N field elements where N is a bit larger than K, right? So it's sort of extends um, the work that you want to uh, encode. And we want, um, First of all, that we want to have a linear Hamming distance. So if we have two distinct code works, then they differ in many places. So there are no code works that are very close to each other. They differ in many places when they're different. Second, we want it to be linear. So if you take a linear combination of uh, two uh, code words, then you actually get the same as the encoding of that linear combination of, of the original message. Uh, and then for efficiency, uh, it's actually interesting that uh, some of these uh, linear error correcting codes that are very efficient can be computed with a linear uh, number of field operations. Okay, so, um, so the, the Compilation into IP, I'm, I'm here sort of like taking the core idea rather than, than the actual uh, instantiation in, in the papers uh, was discovered in uh, two parallel works. Uh, 
one known as, as Lefiera and another with, with uh, uh, people from, from my group. Um, and the idea is to use uh, error correcting codes. So when in the uh, interactive linear commitment model, you want to commit to a vector of field elements, what you do is you encode that uh, with the linear error correcting code and you send those this error corrected uh, uh, this code word uh, the field elements in that code word to uh, the interactive optical proof model if the verifier sends messages to to the prover then that just passes through the same with the prover sends messages to directly to the verifier now this can go on for several rounds um, and in the end uh, when uh, the verifier wants to get so like uh, in, in the interactive linear commitment model would want to query for a, a set of linear combinations. What happens in the interactive Oracle proof model is that you just send the prover sends those uh, linear combinations, just makes a claim that, hey, this is the, the, the vectors that you were asking for. And then there's a final step where the verifier and, and sort of uses the interactive oral proof model to, to check that that answer from the prover is actually correct. Okay, and I'll, I'll show on the next slide how, how that works, what, what the real idea is here, right? So, so here we have vector, uh, vectors A that the prover wants to, to commit to. And the prover would uh, use the error correcting codes and, and in the uh, interactive Oracle proof, uh, submit the, the field elements from those code words. Um, in the interactive Oracle proof, the, the verifier has no clue what those field elements are, but now they are committed, right? It's not something that the prover can change. Now, in order to check that those are actually real code words and not just bogus field elements, uh, the verifier can actually do a, a, a linear test. So the verifier a proximity test. So the verifier sends a random vector t and the prover reveals a linear combination corresponding this, to this t. And after the prover has done that, the verifier can actually do some spot checking. Is that answer by the prover correct? Right? And the way that the verifier does that is basically to ask in the IOP, I would like to see the field elements that correspond to some of the columns of this, uh, this matrix that the code would constitute. And once the verifier sees those columns, then the verifier can uh, himself use the error correcting code to compute the, the, uh, the code word that's supposed to uh, result from the prover's response, but I also then use the columns to check and take the same linear combination of those columns and check that those parts of the code word are actually correct. And it turns out if there's any of these uh, code words that the prover has committed to, which is not really a code word, but just a bogus thing that's far from the code, then that's very likely to be uncovered by the proximity test. And furthermore, if there are any of those columns that are, have faults, then that's also likely to be uh, discovered. And in terms of the so like the response to a query, a uh, linear combination of those elements that the uh, verify wants, then it's exactly the same model. You take the corresponding linear combination, the prover sends that to the verifier, and then the verifier uses the opened columns to check whether that response is correct. So in this way, we can, can actually use the interactive Oracle proofs to compile a proof in the uh, interactive linear commitment model. Okay. Um, so the interesting thing here is that in the interactive oracle uh, proofs, um, we usually don't use um, uh, group elements and, and rely on the discrete logarithm problem, right? This is uh, 
model that's been designed to actually be work with with hash functions. Um, so you do Merkle trees, you hash some things, uh, and then later on you reveal some path from from those Merkle roots. And we can do that uh, as well here. Uh, there's a slight optimization. So, so basically the way it works is that the prover, whenever it has a batch of vectors that she wants to commit to, she applies the error correcting uh, uh, code function to them, uh, gets a, a bunch of, of row vectors, hashes those columns that result from that, right? And that commits to her to those columns. And then when she has the next batch of row vectors, she also applies the error correcting code to it and hashes the columns and so forth. So that way she commits to all of those uh, code words. And whenever the verifier comes along and wants to spot check some of those columns, right? Then she just opens those hashes and, and uh, reveals the, the uh, field elements in them. Um, so from the verifier's uh, perspective, it's just a question of, of checking those uh, spot checked columns and check that the response is correct, right? And then check the uh, uh, original interactive linear commitment proof with respect to that, which is now known to be a correct response from the prover that it really is this linear combination of vectors. Okay, so let's think a little about what, what this buys us. Um, and in terms of efficiency, what we get is actually a linear number of field operations. Um, and why is, is that? Um, so think of it about this from the prover perspective, right? So um, the error correcting code is linear. So it just takes linear time. So that doesn't really give you anything except for a constant overhead. Um, there are hash functions uh, which are linear time computable. So, so again, committing to columns doesn't give you any overhead. And what you end up with is actually a, a linear time proof. Um, I, I put in this table here a, a comparison. Um, um, what you had uh, in the past uh, was um, based on the discrete log problem, you could do um, uh, linear time uh, provers, but where it was a linear number of exponentiations, right? And then you get root n elements. If you do bulletproof, uh, then you get uh, better communication than just a logarithmic number of elements. Um, and what you get here now with this uh, compiler technique is, is root n elements in the communication, right? So it's succinct, but the prover is truly linear, right? There's no exponentiation, and exponentiation is actually expensive, right? But here it's sort of like apples to apples. Um, you're proving something about field operations and the cost is measured in field operations. So it really is true linear time. Uh, and in a later work with, um, with Alessandro uh, Kesa, Jonathan Boodle, we sort of like uh, reduced the communication even more to, to basically being an arbitrary root, a constant root of, uh, of the size of the circuit that you would want to prove. Um, Okay, so there's a couple of, uh, I'll, I'll sort of go into a little bit of a rant here, um, because I think we are now really pushing efficiency of uh, these uh, uh, SNARKs and, and other proof systems. Um, and in olden days, it was very common to see this is linear without specifying what is the unit of computation. Um, I think we're now living in a world where we're really trying to eke out all the factors that, that we can get, all the savings we can get. Uh, and this is important and, and it really makes a, a difference. Um, so, so, so clearly, uh, uh, as, a, as opposed to doing a linear number of exponentiation, if you do a linear number of field operation, that's going to be a, a significant saving. Uh, now, I don't want to claim this is a practical work because the, the big O is actually pretty big. And, and if you want the practical implementation, then you should go to, to the here. Uh, 
Um, speaking of, of practice, um, so one thing we were looking at then was, uh, can we apply this, this type of proof technique to um, more practical questions? And, and we settled on uh, verifiable computation, right? So here the, um, the statement is essentially think of, of um, outsourcing to the cloud. Here's a, a program, here's some input, and the cloud says, okay, here's the output from that program, right? Now you want to verify whether that's correct. And there may or may not be also some, some secret input that the cloud puts into this uh, execution. What we have right now is we have very succinct and easy to verify SNARKs, right? So if you use pairing based SNARKs, you can get down in sort of like the order of a, uh, a few kilobits um, and have really fast verification of the SNARKs, right? So the main bottleneck nowadays is the prover and the time that it takes for the prover to prove uh, a statement. So what we did was sort of like look at this from a theoretical perspective, right? So we picked a, a model for program execution uh, and we settled on a, a model that's been used before, the tiny model, which is essentially an assembly language uh, that allows some small set of operations over, uh, over some words. And, and then we rewrite the verification of that tiny RAM program as constraints in a field and prove that those constraints are satisfied. So there's sort of an embedding of, of those words into a field and then proving that that embedding satisfies some constraints. And what it gives us is uh, actually a snark with almost linear time, right? So, um, so, so if you have a uh, time T computation, uh, so t tiny ram operations then the prover uses uh, it's super linear but an arbitrary small super linear number of tiny ram operations and it's also succinct to inherit from from before that it's basically a root t field elements that it uh, that you have to send and you get negligible uh, soundness error now it's interesting when you so like as a theoreticians try to do, look at practical problem, right? One of the things we were thinking a lot about is what is the right word size, right? Is it so two bits, is it 64 bits or is it something else? Um, and, and we found that the right theoretical model would be to say it's basically the logarithm of the memory, right? You want the words to be able to address any point in memory. Um, in terms of time, this is about as, as good as it gets, right? We could hope for something that's true linear time. Uh, so, so we basically have linear number of tiny RAM operations for linear number of uh, 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 computation, which is T tiny RAM operations. Uh, but again, importantly here, right? We're really comparing apples to apples, right? If we are measuring computation, so like of the program in, in tiny RAM operations, then we should also measure uh, the, comp the computation of the proof with the same measure. So you can sort of like see clearly how they compare to each other. Now, I'm not sure I'm so happy about the soundness error, right? Again, as a theoretician, you're saying, hey, the soundness error is negligible, that's great, right? But in reality, what it is, it's uh, determined by, by one over the field size, um, and the reason we get this super constant overhead is because the field size should be super, super uh, logarithmic in the security parameter, right? And then you get negligible soundness error. Right? But that, that is uh, so like, if you're a practitioner, right? You would so like more look at what are, what are those concrete numbers, right? And if you get one to have like, I don't know, two to the minus security parameter, uh, soundness error, then you would actually have to do some repetition of, of this proof and, and the cost would go up. Okay, so this is like sort of a, a very practice oriented uh, result. And I think it says some interesting theoretical things about practice. Um, if you look at sort of like the constants involved and uh, they do blow up, right? And it's not something you would want to uh, implement just as, as written here. 
Okay, so let me jump to the, to the conclusion here. Uh, I sort of considered myself a theoretician, but practice oriented one of those. Um, so, so I think we are now seeing an enormous amount of work uh, when it comes to SNARKs. Um, and one of those directions we see really pushing is sort of like towards optimal efficiency, right? Can you get true linear time provers um, uh, and, and how, how far can you push down also the constants here, right? Um, and there's some interesting things that have come up when we've been working this direction, which don't come up when you have other overheads that sort of like uh, overshadow uh, the, the efficient, the, these uh, considerations. So one thing that came up in, in the latest paper with uh, uh, Jonathan Butlin and Santo Chiesa, where we got down to, to constant root communication was that uh, a true linear time prover cannot run a sorting algorithm. Right? So we wanted to sort some elements. We could not do that because that would take more than linear time to, to sort them, right? And we had to do that in, in a different way. So there's a lot of things that you have to be really careful about when you're getting pushing so much in efficiency. And I think we're getting to the point where we probably need to think about what is the communication computation model that we are building on and so like does that match practice right and and are there sort of like uh, on unseen uh, overheads in, in those the other thing i think we need to be is, is very careful when we account for cost right a big notation is uh, is great because it simplifies uh, reading things, but it's also very vague, right? And if you have like a truly practical scheme, I don't think you should be using big O notation. You should so like use some concrete numbers. And I think for for schemes that you you want to push for for the efficiency, I think it's also really important to have the the units there. Right? Is it, we're talking about group exponentiation, bits, kilobytes, hashes, field operations, or whatever, right? Because that really does matter right and and i have to say i get so like again ranting a bit here right but i get very annoyed when i see a paper that says this is linear time or this is linear communication without specifying with which unit it is linear right and and i would like to also see that that really compares i mean if we're talking linear time is it linear time compared to the time it would just take to verify the witness directly or is it linear compared to something else. Um, and then I think it's it's uh, exciting that uh, it's a field where we're seeing so much adoption now, especially in blockchain space, right? Um, and I think as we push towards practice, I think theory is still really important for understanding what's going on uh, and also for getting ideas for building proof systems. Um, so, so I like this uh, direction that people have suggested that we should really try to extract the information theoretical models and understand what's going on there, right? And, and as we saw, we actually had sort of like an information theoretical model derived from the discrete log world, but it turned out you could compile that in, in with hash functions, right? And actually get something really efficient out of it. Um, but as we push towards practice, again, I think it's it's not always that clear, easy to, to model, right? I mean, from a theoretical perspective, what is the computer's word size? Is it a constant or is it logarithmic in, in the memory, for instance? Um, and, I, and I guess here really the proof is in, in, in the pudding, right? I mean, I think now we're seeing a lot more papers that also come with implementations, right? And those implementations you could see on a, on a real world computer, what is the time it, it takes to, uh, to, to prove something that you, you won't really care about in, in practice. Um, okay, thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, Jens, uh, really interesting and great talk. Um, we have, yes, let's uh, give a virtual applause. Um, we have uh, several minutes for, for any questions from the audience. Um, let me check the, uh, let me check the um, Zulip as well as anything. Uh, if you could raise your hand, 
or uh, just pipe up, um, unmute yourself and, and ask questions. So I'll start with one question, which is, um, you spoke about the compilation from uh, tiny RAM to then these constraint systems, and then um, the, the various proof systems are designed to prove uh, that all the constraints are satisfied, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I, I imagine there's a good deal of work also in uh, compilation from, um, you know, human readable languages or, or friendly languages to these constraint systems. Um, how much in your experience uh, overhead is there in that stage versus the overhead in the proof system, uh, cryptographic uh, system? And uh, do you have any thoughts about improving uh, overheads on that side? So I don't think I have a good general answer to that, right? Because there's a lot of people that really do this in, in, in practice, right? And, and take uh, different examples of, of computation that they compile. And typically you'll have several steps in, in that compiler. So you may start with sort of the program execution. You sort of like map that into constraints in a field system. Um, you would then map that to sort of like, a, or you may write that as a, what is called a rank one constraint satisfaction system. You would then compile that maybe into a quadratic arithmetic program, right? And then you would put a snark on, on top of, of that. Um, um, and I think at least for the latter version, uh, putting the cryptographic snark at the end is cheap compared to, to uh, the other things uh, that you have to, to do. Um, and uh, certainly our experience when we wrote this, which was a theoretical paper, right? So we did not really try to super optimize uh, the overhead, right? But, uh, you know, it was tedious work to take all these tiny IRM operations and find the constraints. And, and there were a number of overheads in, in those constraints. Um, and as a follow up to that, are there, do, do you think there are um, interesting research directions or what, what are interesting research directions in um, perhaps richer uh, notions of computation that can be expressed uh, or proved, you know, more directly in uh, in SNARKs. I think that's a a, a really good question. Um, uh, and again, I, I'm not too familiar with the other models. I've sort of grown up myself uh, with. So like you wanted to prove that a circuit is satisfiable, right? It's NP complete, it's simple to understand for cryptographers, it just involves some field in which you do additions and multiplications. And, you know, so it's a great model, right? And it's also great then for benchmarking, whenever you have a new proof system, so like when that you have a lot of things that you can compare with, right? And see whether your techniques really are advancing the, the field. Um, but, but it does raise uh, the, the question of, you know, what other things can, can you prove which, which are interesting to, to prove things about, right? And, and people have managed to do so like a, a verifying real computation, say computation as a program written in C or something like that, right? But uh, uh, I think there's been quite a lot of work in, in going into to actually doing that that compilation. Uh, but but now the tools are for that, right? And then you could ask, you know, are there other things that are so sort of like not captured by that very general model, right? But which are still simpler and, and still would be very interesting to to prove. And um, I don't have a, a good example that springs to mind, but uh, it, it certainly seems plausible. Great. Um, we have a question in the chat uh, from Chelsea Comlo, who asks, uh, one of the largest barriers to using SNARKs at a wider scale is their complexity to implementers. Uh, what role do you think theoreticians can have in ensuring that their schemes can be widely understood and therefore used? Right. So I think this separation between an information in theoretic core and so like the cryptographic uh, compilation is, is really strikes to to that right because we want 
the, the more modular things are, the, the easier they are to understand, the easier they are to implement as well, right? And it also makes, ensures that people can sort of like work in, in, in parallel on optimizing different things, right? So you don't have to actually know how you sort of like compile things into to quadratic arithmetic programs in order to optimize, say, elliptic curve operations to do pairing-based snark, right? And, and vice versa, you don't ne need to know too much about elliptic curves and pairings in order to try to optimize uh, towards, uh, say, um, uh, take a rank one constraint satisfaction system and compile that into a, a quadratic arithmetic program. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Are there any other questions out there? We have time for you know, a couple more minutes. Um, so last call for questions to Jens. All right. Well, we're, we're just uh, a minute or two over, so I think that's a good time uh, to end. And if I remember correctly, yes, uh, thank you again, Jens, for a wonderful talk um, and much to think about. And then uh, we have about a 